Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Healing Ties 2.0, featured on the Whole Care Network and on UK Health Radio, the world's number one talk health radio. I'm your host and presenter, Christopher McClellan. You just might know me as the Bowtie Guy. On this episode of Healing Ties 2.0, we visit with author and international speaker Sue Ryan. For more than 35 years, Sue has been in roles of caregiving for supporting of family members and loved ones. Through her personal experience, Sue has moved from being frustrated, overwhelmed, and yes, sometimes frightened, to confident and balanced while navigating the transitions of work, life, and caregiving. I simply loved my conversation with Sue, and I know you will too. Let's join my conversation with the energetic Sue Ryan, and we'll see you on the other side of the show. Well, greetings, Sue, and welcome to another episode of Healing Ties 2.0. It is a delight to have you on the show today. Chris, it is wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity. You know, we've just recently met, but it seems like we've known each other like forever. It does, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. We, did, we recorded another podcast that I work on, and, and I thought, oh, I've got to have Sue on Healing Ties. And you know, and I've, you know, I've kind of forewarned you and prepared you, as I do with all my guests. Sue, how are you creating Healing Ties? Yes, Chris, you did forewarn me. And to give people a perspective on what I do and what's important to me, I'm going to flip the question to you briefly because making sure that before I answer a question or before any of us steps into the definition or the the, the use of something, we want to make sure we have a clear understanding and our definitions are aligned. And so what I will do is return the favor to you and ask you, help me understand your definition of healing ties so that when I respond to the community, I'm sharing based on us being clearly in alignment. Well, it's the first time I've had the question question redirected at me. So I, I, I will, I will oblige because it is a, you know, it is a fair question. And I think in the, in the cliff note version of why, how I'm creating healing ties, it's uh, giving back to, uh, not just the caregiving community, but to the community as as a whole uh, about stories, resources, validation through our caregiving experiences, because that's where I feel that I best fit in this vast network of caregivers is sharing stories so that caregivers that have that are coming after us have those things that we didn't have while we were in the midst of the of caregiving validation resources and respite and i create healing ties by doing podcasts like you because healing ties also means a little bit you know beyond caregiving how do we care how do we care for ourselves our community our family uh, how do we heal and how do we ask that broader question about how are we interacting as a community? How are we creating healing environments so that everybody can prosper? And I do it through story sharing. That just fills my heart. Thank you so very much. And part of what makes me feel great about it is the alignment that we have with that. And the fact that as we have this conversation, people are, under, are going to understand why we are saying and doing the things that we do. I'm, I'm really called to do what your definition of healing ties is because for more than 35 years, I've been in roles of non-professional, some people call it unpaid, some people call it family caregiving. It wasn't what I grew up doing. It wasn't my professional career. It wasn't what I ever thought it would be. And I'm a person of faith, and so I believe there are no coincidences. It was brought to be part of my life experience. And rather than, than say, oh, woe is me, why is that? It's like, oh, why is that? And explore it. And then also be able to take the experiences that for me in the beginning, when I started in my first role of caregiving support, there was no internet. The right. yellow pages didn't have things on it. People certainly didn't talk about their personal family lives with other people, especially not strangers. 
There weren't things in the library, and there, the doctors didn't really have information on it. So I often felt like I was on what I call an emotional roller coaster and blindfolded. I didn't know what I didn't know. My rational mind is trying to help, and things would work one day and not work the other day. And so over the course of the last 35 years and in all of the different experiences I've had and continue to have, I've learned and I've studied and I have those stories. And, and some of them, some of the best learning experiences I've had, which you've probably also heard, are when the outcome was not what we anticipated. One right. of the most profound parts of my entire journey was in, and we'll talk about it later, but in, a, in an experience that I tremendously underserved. And yet what I want people to be able to do and where my, my healing ties part comes is I have a very positive, supportive perspective on caregiving and even in the most challenging of moments and through the stories I tell and through the experiences I have, that's what I model for other people so that they can see it. Because if we can see it in someone else, we can experience it in our lives. And I want other people to be able to see that it can happen so that they can experience it in their lives. And that's part of what I do. The other part of me is I'm a teacher. I teach them how to do it. I model it for them so they can see it and then they have the chance to step into it. So that's my healing ties. Well, we are we are aligned and I, I, I just have been so looking forward to this conversation with you. And there's so many directions that that I could go with you, but I, I I'd like would love for you to talk a little bit about your personal caregiving experience, so our listeners can can get in touch with that as well. Sure. As I mentioned, my first caregiving experience was when I was in my twenties, and it happened actually with my next door neighbors. I was in a, a role of uh, professionally of enterprise application software sales and loved that experience and my neighbors would enjoy taking me to the airport sometimes because I frequently flew out and they just loved that. They wanted to be the, the, my quote unquote limo drivers and we loved each other. And while I, the na- I've protected the names, I've changed the names, but Bob and Mary and Mary started experiencing symptoms of things that just didn't seem quite right. And so our neighborhood community who loved Bob and Mary so much kept leaning in to try to help. And you know, we would use our logical minds to figure something out. And the sweetest person. And for example, one night she got up to go to the bathroom, thought it was Thanksgiving morning, went into the kitchen to turn the oven on to preheat the oven for the Thanksgiving turkey. And generationally, the generation they were in, they used to keep their bread and chips and things in the oven to keep them fresh. And so Bob wakes up to the smell of melting plastic and things like that. So my first caregiving experience was what I had said. There's no internet. There's no, there are no answers. Our logical minds are trying to do things. We're just constantly feeling like we're under serving Mary. We don't know what to do. Bob, Bob says, I'm going to take care of her myself. You know, this for better, for worse, we're doing it at home and all of these things. And so it was, it was not an easy experience. And yet I said, it doesn't have to be this way. I'm going to learn. And I did not realize that that would include my grandmother and my father, and now my husband, and then several other family members and and loved treasured friends. And so I've been continuously basically on this role of family or or non-paid or non-professional, whatever you want to call it, caregiving roles for over 35 years. And I've navigated every part of it from before it's happening to after our loved one passes. And isn't it wonderful to be able to take from a take from a personal experience to help others navigate their journey? It is. And, and thank you, because that is when you talk about, you know, healing ties, that is what I realized a few years ago. That is what I'm called to do. I was called to do several things. One of it, those is to integrate all the areas of my life, which I had originally been taught to keep separated, your personal life, your faith life, your health life, your professional life, leverage what I've learned in each area to support being stronger in others and then introduce people and teach people that along with the perspective I was able to develop so that people's journeys can be much, much easier and they can take care of themselves and feel great about themselves even while they're going through challenging journeys and 
no matter what phase of the journey their loved one is in, they can embrace the tiniest, tiniest, beautiful moment and make wise right. choices in the most challenging. It's, it's wonderful how you're just kind of leading me right into my thoughts of what I wanted to just discuss with you because did you tell people this is not rehearsed this is not rehearsed this is <laughs> this not, is not rehearsed. Think, all my list this is not I don't, I don't have any questions i mean my goodness <laughs> but oh journey and journey. there's something that uh, that i read on your your website which is actually quite spectacular and i'm going to make Thank sure you. that everybody is listening to this podcast today visit to your website we'll get all that information out but this really resonated with me and I've not seen it anywhere when I'm being brutally honest here. The journey begins with me. And yes. we're all, when we're in the midst of caregiving and, you know, I'm, I'm a broken record here when my listeners will say, you know, nobody caregiving happens and you're not prepared, all those things. And you're trying to do for somebody else and you just continue to do for somebody else and who gets lost in the shuffle me and so mm -hmm. when you when you wrote that I said the journey begins with me that really resonated and i'd love for you to just kind of elaborate why does the journey begin with me the caregiver yes thank you for asking that question it's so powerful for, for people and very, 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 actually, basically nobody I've ever talked with has really done this, which doesn't mean people haven't. It just hasn't been my personal experience. In my professional life, in the, in the, the variety of uh, ideal client communities I serve, one of them is people intentionally navigating transitions in their lives, which caregiving is, is a transition. It's a transition, yeah. And in that, the more we understand each ourselves, the better we understand ourselves, the better we understand how we're naturally wired. We each came into the world naturally wired a certain way. We naturally deal with stress in a certain way. We naturally have strengths. We naturally have gaps. We naturally have different perspectives that, that are easier for us to step into. For example, you will see in a meeting, you go to a room, whatever kind of room it is, you'll see people who are out there. They're very gregarious. They love to share. They love to speak. They're right. the, they're the, mm -hmm. they're the, and then there are people who are so much more comfortable being reserved. You see people who, in the midst of, of challenge, deep challenge, develop almost a sense of calm. They're able to, to have great clarity. And then you have people that when there are times that are challenging, they're they're really taken off course they're really stressed they're, they're... so when i say the journey begins with me it's giving ourselves permission to be who we really are meant to be who we were created to be and to have clarity on what that is so that whether we're in a time of challenging i call it like in a dementia moment with our loved one or where our loved one is having a, a significant physical experience no matter what it is or right. where we're sitting there and they're able to just barely move their finger, but they are, that we understand ourselves. And the other part I use on that with, with giving ourselves permission is when we understand how we're naturally wired and when we understand our perspective on the world and we're able to explore our beliefs and our values and our purpose and get them updated and get them current so they serve us, then they won't sabotage us in our caregiving journey and... It makes it easier for us to give ourselves permission to be who we are and permission to be who we're not. One of the, for example, big decisions in caregiving is do I keep my loved one at home? Do I put them in a continuing care community? And personalities tend to come into that a lot and our sense of obligation. Well, when we understand our personalities, we understand who we are. If we know we're not best qualified for that, then we're able to answer that. So that also gets into self-care. So all, there's so many pieces where when we begin our journey, understanding who we are and having permission to be that, the conversations we have, the experiences we have, the team we create, all of those things, the experiences we have when we're fully present with our loved one are so much easier to step into. I like to say, when we realize that our caregiving cape is limited, and that we can't snap it and everything just fixes itself, uh, then we have a little bit better handle and acceptance about really what our 
abilities and capabilities are, and it's a tad bit easier to reach out for reach out for help. Reach out for help. And I would say, you know, when we know what they are, we can go through the closet and look at all the capes and find the one that fits. Oh, I, I like that. <laughs> Especially since I've just lost 35 pounds, so my I have a different size cape right now. So there you go. You can go put on the cape. Well, and then I go. I put on the smaller. I can go put on the smaller version. Yeah, I like that. I'm, so you can put on a smaller version. I'm putting on a cape now after 35 years that I certainly would not have been able to have put on in my first, you know, several years. It, it, exactly because you, it's a it's a learn as you go experience. Yes. And. You, you you take from that experience and hopefully we we learn and then we share and then we improve. Well, I'll, I'll, to your point, since I led you into something, I'll lead you into something. One of the things I talk with uh, um, the, my community about with my coaching clients when we're talking about understanding our personalities, so <laughs> our personalities are formed when we're like around the ages of around seven or eight by that, by that, or from their childhood of like around seven or eight and our beliefs and our values and things like that, they all kind of get molded in that early time frame, And then off we go, they become highly unconscious to us. So it's like they're running our lives because we're not really thinking about them. We've gone to the next thing like discernment and things like that. Well, I use the picture of people with pants that are too short for them. When I was seven years old, <laughs> I wore pants of a certain size. And I've outgrown those pants. So why would I think that the traits of my personality that I've been living, my, the beliefs that I gained when I was there that, either, that, that are either ones that say that I shouldn't or couldn't do something or that strengthen me and my values, that none of those would have wanted to have been refined or updated or said, oh, yeah, I don't need you anymore from the time we were that age. Let's step into, and this is, again, why the, the, the reason of, the journey begins with me. Step into who we are today and live from that space. Put on the cape that fits. It's called stepping into your comfort zone. It's called stepping. Beautiful, Chris. Stepping into your. You know what? You ought to speak on that. Well, I would like to speak on that with you. Well, let's do it. I think we could do a, a tag team presentation on that. I like that. I like that, too. So. Because, you know, we've known each other 35 years. It's been like, you know, even if it's been 30 days, we've. it seems like we've known each other 35 that's, that's right. Even though this is the second time we've met, we've known each other for 35 years. So. We've known each other for 35. But the, there's right. there, there's so much to, to, to talk about today. But the other thing I wanted to, to get into is your five steps to navigating your caregiving journey. I, th these are so critical and just so important for for caregivers to, to hear. Yes, so uh, what, I, what I did when I first felt this real significant calling to write about the caregiving journey, the process inside while we're caregiving, uh, I called it our journey of love, five steps to navigate your caregiving journey. And it was because as you're talking about, I wanted to share the lessons and the stories, the things that I had learned. So many people had been asking me and so many people before me had shared. And so while I've now created the caregiver's journey and the five steps to navigate your caregiving journey sits right in the middle of it, mm -hmm. I began with that because that was really what was on my heart the most at that time. And what it is, is it's not five linear steps. It is, and so you could read the book backwards, right. forwards, inside out, it doesn't really matter. And I've, I've actually created an online course uh, that people can participate in if they choose to, that takes a deep dive into learning different areas of our caregiving journey. One of the areas that I talk a lot about, and it gets on, it gets to being able to do it better when you, the journey begins with me, where we understand ourselves, is the different mm -hmm. roles of caregiving support. For example, right. with, with us, my husband is now in the advanced stages of Alzheimer's disease. Well, I have been from the very beginning, I've been his primary caregiver. And in the beginning, I was his primary caregiver along with his physician. So uh, I had the role of primary caregiver, and then I had care partner with a physician. As his diagnosis has progressed, it has been appropriate for me to bring other people in to support and create the caregiving team. And when I have mm -hmm. under, an understanding of what that is, then it's easier for me to know how do I support 
them having their best experience caring for my husband. How do I put my husband in the best place, or our care receiver, we'll say the care receiver. How do I put the care receiver in the best place to have the best right. experience? And what are the things that are my responsibility? How do I navigate that? And it shifts based on the roles. So one of the things I focus on is the roles of caregiving support. Something else I talk about, which, uh, which I just uh, modeled when we got started, one of the things I've seen so much in caregiving is that we use labels that because for most of us, right. now there are people who, and God bless these people, the people who have said, I want to be a, a certified nursing assistant. I want to be a nurse. I want to be a hospice nurse. I want to have these roles. There are people who have stepped into it because that's their passion. Well, that's, that was not me. So all of a sudden one day flip a switch, you're a patient, I'm a caregiver. They shot, they, you know, like, here's this whole big thing. Well, what's caregiver? It's all this. It's all this. And you got married and you're for better or worse. All this. It's like, whoa. So it's, it's as we go into there, part of it's the rules. But then it's people say, well, the disease. Oh, this horrible, dreadful, debilitating disease. And just as we were taught as children to respect people of authority, to respect people who are more knowledgeable, it's easy right. for us to take on their label of the disease because they're an expert. And so then that's right. the lens to which we see the disease and we never look at what's going on. And the other one is right. three of the worst, I wish I shouldn't say worst, the three of the most misapplied words in our lives. These three words prevent us from having the correct emotion, which prevents us from having the best experience which just prevents us from having the outcome that's really going to serve ourselves and others. And these three words, guilt, worry, and sorry. <laughs> First of all, we tend to jumble them all up. Right. Second of all, I they, mentioned when we're very young. They could young, be interchangeable, five, sure. <laughs> they're interchangeable. You know, for example, when you were a child, this is, so we're learning these things very, very young before we learn right. discernment. You do something wrong, apologize. You do something wrong, apologize. Well, we're constantly doing things wrong. We don't try to, we apologize. We grow up saying, I'm sorry for things that we haven't had any responsibility for. But how many exactly. times has anybody gone to the dictionary and looked up the definition of the word sorry? Sorry is apologizing for something you have responsibility for. And so people start saying, I'm sorry, which means they're taking on, it's, it's, it doesn't seem like it's a big deal, but it really is. You're taking on res responsibility for that experience, part of you. And the other thing is you're underserving the experience. If somebody comes to you and says, I've received a diagnosis of cancer. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So you've checked off the box that you've had a, a reaction, a response, and they've, you know, they've said what it is. Well, it doesn't allow you to step into how do I serve them? How do I support them? How do I well, serve how do them? How do I, feel? right. Right. How can I really help them? What are the ways to do it? I'm sorry. Why are you apologizing for something you had nothing to do with? How about something, and you do it with whatever thing is explained to you, but how, tell me how you're feeling. Where can I be supporting you? Could I give you rides to your treatments? Could I pick things up? Or are there, you know, are there people, what things can I be doing to supporting you? And how would you like to have support? Wouldn't that be a much better experience? Okay, so I'll go through the other one. We won't do all three of them. The other one, because this is the other one that's like, seriously? Okay, guilt. Somebody guilt. invites you to go to lunch and your husband guilt. is sitting there and he's got a diagnosis. Well, I'd love to go to lunch, but I'd feel so guilty leaving him and I can't leave him because, well, you know, if I leave him, then he's here by himself and I'm going out and having a good time. And I can't have a good time if he's doing that. And I feel really guilty. No, I'm not going to do it. And, so and I'm the only caregiver can, that can take care of him. I, he, I can't leave him by who I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't do that. Do it. And no. it's a burden and it's a weight. And then resentments are unmet expectations so oh my you goodness are, gracious saint ignatius isn't that that is that is off the reason exactly you're building a resentment whether you know it or not because you're preventing yourself from self-care from doing things you're meant to we're meant to thrive in our lives so you're using the wrong emotion for that now perhaps flip it someone invites you to lunch you would love to go to lunch your husband has a mm -hmm. diagnosis and there's not currently someone to care for him. The conversation you have is, oh my gracious, I would love to have lunch with you. The things I need to work out, and perhaps we could try to figure this out together. I'd love to have somebody be able to be here with my husband 
I don't prefer that he's alone, and I prefer that he be able to have some conversation so I'd have more peace of mind and I'd enjoy our experience more. Let's see how we make that happen, and then let's go and have a wonderful lunch together. So these are the kinds of things I talk about in the book. Well, I'm... I'm somewhat speechless because <laughs> uh, because it aligns so much with uh, my thoughts as well. But I I, I I want to do something here. I've never done this before. Okay. Uh, on a show, but I want to do a quick role play. Okay. And I, 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 I it's going to be very similar to what you, we just talked about about your about your steps here, and I'm going to be the uh, I'm. I'm going to be the the person with the diagnosis, and then you're. I'm going to be telling you that. You know, so I, I was just diagnosed with uh, esophagus cancer. I don't know what to do. Wow. Help me understand how you're feeling about that. That, that had to have just hit you out from left field. All of a sudden, you go to the doctor in the morning, and the day's a beautiful day, and you come out, and you're shell-shocked. You're looking around. You, you, you don't know what to do. Where are you right now? How are you feeling right now about that? I, I, I'm kind of shell-shocked. I had no idea. I mean, I knew I had some discomfort in my throat, but I yeah. I had no idea something like this was was there. What, what am I going to do? You know, Chris... You know, we're not very far apart. May I come sit with you? Could we could we sit down and just chat? You know, I'd, would you feel, would you feel better if you weren't alone? Would it feel more comfortable if you could just, even though you're not really sure what to say or do right now, would it be better if you were just able to be with somebody? I would really like that. That's wonderful. I'll I'll come and we'll just sit. We don't need to talk about anything because you know what, Chris? Here's one thing I'll let you know: you will never be alone. I'm not going to have all the answers. You don't have all the answers. But you know what? We're going to find them together, and we're going to find other people who can support us and give you the answers, and you will never be alone. Well, thank you for, for doing this, because one of the reasons uh, for, uh, I'll get into the esophagus cancer question, because that's what Richard had. But in, in our conversation earlier, we talked about, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. And, Nine times out of ten, when somebody says that to another person, oh, I'm sorry. And then from there, you're kind of stuck. What do you, you know, how do you move on? How do you, you know, I'm sorry. What, what, what can I do for you? Or, you know, it, it, it's, I'm Here's sorry Chris, that I'll, some. I'll give you the thing. I'll give you the thing that, 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 you know, I talk about having permission. Right. One of the things I'm sorry does is when we don't know what to say or do, you say I'm sorry, and then you've checked the box that you've said something, and you feel right. better. But, right. but you don't have to have the answer. You don't, don't have, have to have, have the to answer. Know the answers. Mm-hmm. What we want to do is we want to. Now, here's the other thing. I am definitely not saying because I know people who are. They, they like you know as we talk you were behind the door when god handed out compassion it's just not you know part of your filter you have other things but that's not <laughs> it so for them wanting to step in or sit with somebody or do that that's not who they are so right when you say but you say it to the to the authenticity of who you naturally are for who example are. what i could have yeah. said is hey chris i'll bet you that it's going to be you know you're going to be times when you're not going to be able to get to the grocery store I'm not really sure how you, you know, how all this journey stuff's going to navigate. You got my phone number when I can go run an errand or do something for you or if you need something, you just let me know. Just let me so know. Even that whatever it is, it is. Okay? Now, there's another side of that, so I'll introduce you to one other part in the book if you'd like on the flip side of that. I'm, one of the I'm things all that was so I'm helpful all ears. for me mm-hmm. because I recognize that different friends have different capacities in their roles of care of, right. of wanting to support us, wanting to do something mm-hmm. to help. And they're like, well, what, what, can I help you? And I said, yeah, I said, you know what, here's the, yes, I t- uh, yes. Because for so many of us, I'm, I can do this all by myself. I don't need help. The sooner you get to, oh, yes, thank you very much. I'm in a season where I can use help. And then I can put that back on the shelf later. Open yourself up to allowing yourself to have help and then making a list 
There were things mm-hmm. where if somebody had 15 minutes, this is something they could do if they had 15 minutes. This is something right. they, they could do if somebody had an hour. This is something if somebody wanted to share a few hours. So I would invite them into the consideration of something that I could use their help with based on what they had capacity for. They want to help. And so often people say, no, I don't need any help. <sighs> Get over there. I, don't, and, I uh, can do it, then I can do it all myself. Side, give them options. Right. Right. And, you know, I, like, I love to use that analogy about like a baseball team. Uh, the best baseball teams have a variety of players on the team. They can't have, they can't all be home run hitters. Uh, and I, and for my listeners in, in the United Kingdom, I'll say, okay, in, in soccer, you can't have all uh, offensive players. You have to have some defensive players too. You have to have a mixture of talent. And when you can, Take that 15 minutes or an hour and sort out what you need. And then you can look around and say, oh, I have friends that can do this, 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 and this. And then you you kind of feel a little bit more comfortable in saying, yes, I can I, I can take that offer about getting some milk at the grocery store. Well, and stepping into permission, your your analogy is beautiful because there wouldn't be a midfielder in soccer if that wasn't a role that made the game successful. Right. The game, you know, each thing that we do, a team that we have, whether it's what any area where we have a team in a community, whether it's someone who writes notes about the meetings, whether it's someone who leads the meetings, whether it's, you know, whether it's the soccer goalie, whether it's the pitcher, if those weren't vital roles, we wouldn't have them. And so we're not always, you're not always meant to hit a home run. Sometimes we just need right. somebody to get a single. And so we need to be able to do those. And so it's stepping into permission of that. So your analogy is, is perfect. Oh, goodness gracious. I'm just, I'm just having a great old time today. So, but I think, I think this is a perfect spot to uh, take our break. And, you know, Sue, this, you got to prepare yourself. Because when we come back from the break, I'm going to ask you about one fun fact that I We don't know about you that I know all the listeners are on the edge of their seats just waiting to know this fun (laughs) fact. And we've had a lot of terrific fun facts on Healing Ties this uh, this season. So you're listening to Healing Ties 2.0, featured on the Whole Care Network and on UK Health Radio, the world's number one talk health radio. We'll be right back. Hey, it's uh, Christopher McClellan. You just might know me as the Bowtie Guy on Healing Ties 2.0. On Healing Ties, we visit with people from all over the globe who share their stories because it's through story sharing where diversity meets the road to collaborate with common cause. And if you'd like to share your story on Healing Ties, email me direct at thebowtieguy at healingties.com. We would love to to share your story to your health, happiness, and prosperity. Welcome back, everybody. I am continuing my delightful conversation with the author, caregiver advocate, and now my new best friend, uh, Sue Ryan. So, Sue, okay, time's up. We need to know that what is that fun fact about Sue Ryan that I'm on the edge of my seat because I know it's going to be interesting. I just, I just can feel it. Okay, I I'll, I will go with one that is n- not as commonly known, although I did put it in my media kit. I enjoy doing things that are exploratory. For example, I've gone cliff diving, I've been bungee jumping, I've been skydiving, I've done a lot of things like that. And it's not for the uh, a danger kind of a thing. But I talk in my life about being present, being radic- massive acceptance and radically present, being radically present in the moment. And one of the things when you have experiences like this is 
I can practice all the things up to where the moment of, of just like letting go is, but you, but that's different mm -hmm. for each one. I love to, to learn about myself in that brief instant when, for example, if you do cliff diving, when you just release yourself from the cliff. Uh, when I did the bungee jumping, when you release yourself from the platform. Or in skydiving, when you release yourself from the plane. You learn a lot about yourself in that moment that you hadn't. And so that's been something that I've enjoyed doing joyfully. So I, I'm kind of, I'm getting a picture of this. You know, the, the, the trajectory of getting, jumping out of the plane, or it, that, that's got to be adrenaline. Okay, so interestingly, um, you, you know all the things that you're doing to prepare for it. So there's energy and there's excitement and nervousness, all of those energies. Mm -hmm. At that brief instant, what I choose to have is a very, very deep inner calm so that I'm completely open to experience. And then once I'm out, I can experience something else. But what I really want to do in that just brief moment, because in these in these moments, because I've studied and things like that, I don't have any fear. I don't have an emotion that's holding me back. It's just the letting go and seeing who hmm. I am when I let go. That inner calm. I, mm -hmm. I really like that. And then I start doing things like giggling. You know, I, I showed horses <laughs> for many, many years. And one of the ones that I did was called cutting, where you separate a, a cow from uh, the herd. And I loved it so much. You know, it's all these big cowboys and everything. And I'm out there doing that. It's just, you know, and I'm giggling. The judges had no idea what to do, but I was having so much fun. I couldn't, I couldn't keep my joy inside. So yeah, I do a lot of that. And I was doing that when I was skydiving and the, the, the guy was kind of like, what? You know, so. Now, now there is an important tip for everybody. Don't keep your joy inside. No, no. Celebrate it. Yeah, it's meant. Wow. It's meant to be. It's meant to come out. Yeah, there's a there's an, another important um, topic I'd like to discuss with you as we um, move forward here, and I, I it just really hit home with me, and and I think it's real appropriate as we're in our in our second uh, segment here. The grace of grief. Mm. Uh, I, my listeners have heard me say this, and I'm not sure we talked about it before, but I. I'm just a real big proponent that there's uh, two very common aspects to caregiving. There's a beginning and there's an end, and we're not prepared for either one of these life-changing events. And when I read this, The Grace of Grief, um, it takes a while to get there, but there is grace in grief. Yes. Uh, the, the reason that I, I created the grace of grief is that one of the, we would not have an emotion if we weren't meant to experience it. We're, right. we were just talking about joy, okay? Right. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the beauty of the experience of joy. Well, if you have joy and you have it clouded over by fear and, all, and, and, and anger and all these other emotions, then you're not really purely experiencing joy. The same thing in the caregiving, other parts of the caregiving experience. When we keep all of our emotions jumbled up and we don't explore them and we don't have our own relationship with them, then the purpose they have in our lives cannot be achieved and we can't learn about ourselves in them because we are meant to learn about ourselves through the emotions because when you take an emotion and you tie it to an experience, that's what creates the memory. Right. And so emotions are extremely important in our lives. And the more we, we serve the correct emotion, the emotion that we're meant to have for the experience we have, then the more it will serve our lives. Grief, for example, will help us, and, and there are other people, you know, you can use it however you want, but grief helps us develop resilience. It teaches about ourselves. It gives us strength. It helps us understand what fills our heart and what breaks our heart. And so I wrote The Grace of Grief for several reasons. One of them is so that when we begin to feel something that could be thought of as grief, we're able to separate other emotions from it. The example I give is like, like and I do this in several areas of the journey, you have this big rubber band and it's got all the rubber bands all tied around in a ball. Uh -huh. 
Mm -hmm. You can't experience anything when everything's all jumbled up. So it's take each one of them out and process them. And so what I, what I invite people into the consideration of is separating grief from other emotions so that you experience it more fully and it has the impact it's, it's meant to have in our lives for us. Then the other reason, and when I created the caregiver's journey, the journey from like before or in the very beginning of the caregiving journey starting and the last phase of it I call moving forward is so that we don't stay stuck in grief. And what I have learned in my life and observed from many people is when we don't know how to have grief fill our lives, to live in grief and process it and experience it, if we don't, we can't move forward from it. And many people stay stuck in grief because nobody's taught you. They've taught seven stages of grief or this. Well, each of us experiences it differently. If we haven't given ourselves permission to experience it and learn, just like you learn math, you know, learn how to experience grief for the way you are meant to experience it in the way you naturally are. Permission to be right. me. How do you experience grief? So that you experience it from very early in the caregiving journey. We can't just decide we want to go to lunch together anymore. Now, if we're going to go to lunch, we have to find somebody and do this, blah, blah, blah. You're grieving the, 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 the just spontaneousness of things. Okay, so they're all different pieces of it. So mm -hmm. experience grief and, and the grace of it, the beauty of it in our it's lives, beautiful. even when it's breaking our heart, so that right. we can then move forward in our lives because we are meant to thrive in our lives, not stay stuck. The stay grace of stuck grief. in your staying stuck in your grief. I can definitely get in touch with that. And I it's was, not always just grief. I was stuck you might for, stay stuck for, in a place in your life. You might stay stuck in a job. You might stay stuck in a relationship. It, mm -hmm. How do you become unstuck? Mm -hmm. And that's uh, what I do in my uh, the other community is help people not stay stuck. I help them navigate transitions so they get from where they are to what's amazing. Well, you know what? You're pretty amazing. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate Goodness. that. I, I have a I have a feeling we're going to do a few more of these soon. What do you think? I'd love to. Yeah, I'd love to. My too. my big, you know, what fills my heart is sharing all of this with everybody because there was a time in my life I didn't know it and I'm so much happier and better and more balanced than when I didn't know all this. And see, and that's why you're creating healing ties. That's why I'm creating healing ties. You're exactly right. Yeah. These are my So let all ties. our so let all our listeners know how they can be in touch with you and your website information and just all the goodies you have available for, for people to live a fulfilled life. Well, thank you. I will. My website is sueryan.solutions, and I have offerings for whether you want to intentionally navigate transitions in any area of your life or you would like to focus on the specific area of your life, which is the caregiving journey. I've created a five phased uh, program called the caregiver's journey. And, and in all of the offerings that I have, I provide individual or one-on-one -on -one coaching. I provide group coaching and I've been creating online courses. So for the five steps to navigate your caregiving journey, I have an online course that I'm going to re-release the end of November. And if anybody would be interested in taking it, just, send me an email. On my website, I have, uh, on the, under the media page, I have information on, I, 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 as you can tell, I love to speak. So I speak to organizations. And um, I, teach the, I teach the course. And I do workshops. And so you do workshops. I, do, uh, I do customized workshops. So yeah, so it's all different ways for people to uh, connect to their experience. And you're an awesome podcast guest as well. Thank you very much. I'm also in the process of writing several other books. I've, I've, I've written several, and, and now I'm in the process of, uh, of a few more. So, Well, I'm just going uh, to remind you of one, one thing. Make sure you take some time for yourself because the, community, the community of caregivers needs your energy. It is just a delight to visit with you today. Thanks so much for doing this, Sue. Well, thank you. It's a gift from my heart. I appreciate it. And it's wonderful to meet you, Chris, uh, again, for our, our, you know, our, second, our second time. So by the time we get together a third time, will we have known each other 60 years? I think so. <laughs> I like that. 
<laughs> well, have a beautifully good. blessed rest of your day. And, and I'll leave everybody with one thing. One of the ways you can start this journey on yourself, for yourselves is to become unquenchably curious because so much of what we do is highly unconscious to us. Just go back to like when you were a very young child. Start asking questions. Become unquenchably curious. Do things differently. If you brush your teeth with your right hand, use your left hand. If your morning routine is A, B, C, D, E, shift it up. Just start becoming aware of what you're doing. And when you're in your caregiving experience, when whatever experience you're in, be focused fully. I talk a lot about massive acceptance and radical presence. Accept exactly where you are without any judgment. Stay radically present in the moment and see what the moment brings to you. Stay radically present in the moment, and I have thoroughly enjoyed this time with you, Sue. Thank you. Bye, everybody. I feel very fortunate to have the opportunity to visit with people like Sue Ryan. Sue is an inspiration, and while transitions in life can be hard, it's wonderful to know there are people like Sue out there who can help guide us on our journey. And I want to thank you for joining us today for this episode of Healing Ties. And just like Sue, if you'd like to share your story on Healing Ties, email me direct at thebowtieguy at healingties.com. We would love to share your story on Healing Ties. As you know, I'm your host and presenter, Christopher McClellan. I've created a life to love after caregiving ends. By being with awesome people like you. We'll see you for another episode of Healing Ties real soon. And be sure to subscribe to Healing Ties wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Take care. Bye for now.